Hello everybody, Roger says hey. So today we're going to be getting into part two of the Gallipoli campaign. I appreciate all of your comments on part one answering my questions. Of course I first learned about Gallipoli through my Anzac Day video that I did a few weeks back and I guess I was kind of surprised to learn that it was orchestrated by the UK because you know I don't really know a whole lot about World War One and I also learned a little bit about Winston Churchill's role in it which I had no idea you know about his role in World War One either. So what we're going to do before we get into part two is I just want to kind of briefly highlight a few of your comments and answer my questions and just do sort of like a little review. So I remember kind of being surprised that the UK committed just kind of some old worn down ships to Gallipoli. And I asked, you know, what was the state of the UK's navy at this point? Because, you know, I know that they had a huge naval empire or just a huge empire that was kind of built on the backs of the strength of its navy. And Melkor says that during this time, the British still had the biggest navy in the world, but Germany had been in a naval arms race with Britain before the war. And as such, Germany had also one of the biggest navies in the world at the time. So it looks like at this point in history, Britain still enjoyed a nice naval superiority over the rest of the world. I also kind of asked, you know, was trench warfare unique to World War One? Because I couldn't really recall it in other wars that I had looked at before. Peter Smith said trenches had been around for hundreds of years. They had been used in siege warfare since ancient times. They were common in the Crimean War and the American Civil War. The problem with the First World War that caused such heavy reliance on trenches was that military science was at a technical hiatus. The machine gun and barbed wire seriously impeded open warfare. Tanks were the answer. So first of all, I've recently been getting into more ancient history going back to the Romans and the Greeks. And I'm getting into the Alexander the Great series right now. And I'm really looking at ancient warfare for the very first time. So it'll be interesting to see if the trenches come up at any point during that. Because I didn't really know that it went that far back, you know. But I guess it kind of makes sense. Like your natural tendency, I guess, as a human is to take cover from whatever's being shot at you. And trenches is kind of like one of the logical things to, to dig, I guess. It also surprises me that they were used in the American Civil War because I've actually studied that more extensively than I have other things and I can't recall ever coming across trench warfare during the Civil War. And I'm sure it happened, you know, it's just for whatever reason I, I just haven't run across it before. So that's really interesting to me and I'm gonna have to go back and kind of look that up and learn a little bit more about that. And so my question here is were tanks actually used in World War One, or was that something that was kind of invented later for World War Two? You know, I just I'm pretty clueless when it comes to the technology used during World War One. So I guess the recurring theme is I need to learn more about World War One. <laughs> I also had a question about the Victoria Cross and what its significance was. And Tiberius Rex says the Victoria Cross is the highest award for gallantry in combat in the Commonwealth. It's highly regarded and extremely rare since its creation in 1856. Only 1,358 have been awarded, considering it was technically available to all soldiers in the British Empire and later the Commonwealth, it is much more rare than even the US Medal of Honor which has been awarded over 3,500 times to U.S. soldiers. I had a feeling it was more akin to the Medal of Honor since they said that only six uh, were awarded out of like 400 casualties or something like that. So it's also interesting that it's awarded a lot less than the Medal of Honor. I wonder if the numbers are skewed at all because of America's involvement in wars and combat over the past 60 to 70 years. I feel like we're constantly engaged in something and so there's always like an opportunity to earn a Medal of Honor or if it's genuinely just awarded way less. All right, so that's it for your comments. I really appreciate them once again. We're gonna go ahead and get into part two of this. I think this part is gonna be getting more into just kind of like the situation going on in Gallipoli because I believe the campaign was around eight months is what you guys said. So probably gonna get into more of just what it was like, like just being there for eight months. All right, so let's go ahead and let's watch this. By June, the Allies were getting nowhere, but the army, which had now grown in size, still needed to be supplied and everything had to come by sea. 
The beaches had become vast military complexes. Supplies and ammunition were landed at piers before wow. being taken up. Oh, look at that. That looks like just um, a mess, I guess. I mean, it's just, there's just stuff scattered everywhere. That's insane. But I mean, you guess, you know, what, what else do you do? But seriously, I didn't expect it to look like that. To the front line. Although it was a rear area, it was never truly safe because not so far away somewhere were the Turks and more importantly, the Turk artillery firing onto the beaches, which from their own maps, they knew precisely where they were and uh, were continually laying down shell fire. I mean, can you imagine being there for eight months and just be constantly shelled like that? And you're stuck, like there's nowhere to go. The only way to avoid casualties was to dig and dig in deep. And this is exactly what they did along the coastline, uh, was to construct dugouts, dig into the banks of the cliffs, create uh, subterranean passageways and caverns. Some of them were quite substantial, huh. uh, in which a whole platoon, uh, possibly in some cases even a company, could rest when, uh, when out of the trenches. OK, well, I guess this is where you go. Not all soldiers enjoyed the relative security of these dugouts, and casualties on the ground continued to rise. The barges which arrived with provisions would depart with a grimmer cargo. The wounded and the dying laid out on the decks waiting for evacuation became a constant sight on the beaches at Gallipoli. Oh my gosh. The soldiers may have gone, but out to sea, the vessels still remain. Uh, you see the pictures of the barges filled with dead bodies. And when you dive onto such a, a barge, of course, it has uh, a much more stronger feeling. You are there. Uh, the dead bodies are not there, the wounded soldiers are not there, but uh, the carrier is still there. It's still 1915 down there. The Dardanelles campaign was supposed to last no more than a few weeks. But six months after the Allied fleet had so confidently sailed into these seas, the prospects of success were looking bleak. The high ground above the beaches, where the Anzac troops had landed, was still dominated by the Turks. The Anzacs were pinned down Just in a confined space, crazy. and there was no room to land reinforcements. Oh my god, look how, look how sh uh, shallow that beach is. I mean, there's, there's nowhere to go. Except up the cliffs. And I guess maybe dig into them. It looks like there might be a cave or something in the bottom right corner here, but oh my gosh. Yeah, they did not fare well getting that beach. So General Hamilton decided to open a new front. His plan was to land troops at Suvla Bay, five miles north of the Anzac beaches. They would advance behind the Turkish defenses, cutting them off and link up with the besieged Anzac units to assist their breakout. Okay, it's, how big was this island? Because this does not look, just from this map, this does, this does not look that big to me. So it's kind of crazy that like there's, nothing's really happening. It's, they're, they're, the, the Anzacs and the UK troops are all pinned down. The, the Turks are just shelling them. They're not really advancing towards them. Nobody's advancing towards anybody. Everybody's just kind of in place, you know? This island just doesn't look that big to me, but I don't know. Like, it's, it's kind of hard to tell from this animation. So I might be completely off with my perspective on this. A huge force of fresh troops for the new landings were allocated to the task. Twice as many as Hamilton had been able to deploy for the first landings in April. And the beaches here presented less of a challenge than before. The terrain at Suvla Bay is actually rather different from the ground at Anzac or Helles. And in many ways, it's better suited to a landing operation. The beach is wide and flat, and there's a oh. good deal of fairly flat ground beyond that. Wow. But the key to the area is the horseshoe of fairly high hills that surrounds it. And in many ways, the battle would turn on who reached this high ground first. 
The area around Suvla was only lightly defended, and this time Hamilton hoped the attack would have the element of surprise. He also had some important new technology. At the north of Suvla, at a place the Allies called Kangaroo Beach, are the remains of a remarkable military innovation. This is the remains of a beetle, one of the motor lighters that was used to bring troops ashore at Suvla in August 1915. And it may not look much now, but in fact it was an amazingly advanced piece of equipment in comparison to the rowing boats that were used in April 1915. Oh my goodness. Oh, they're doing Beetles were armored boats that could carry 500 men. They could deliver troops directly onto the beach using a ramp which could be lowered over the bows. Oh. The troops called them beetles because of the antennae like structures on board. They are, in effect, early landing craft, not dissimilar in principle to the sort of thing that we saw on D Day in 1944. I was just thinking that. To maintain surprise, the landing took place at night, and there was no naval bombardment. Okay. At 9.30 p.m. on August the 6th, the first of the troops landed on the beaches around Suvla Bay. 30 minutes later, 3,000 men were ashore without a single casualty. Oh my gosh. Well, that's very different then. The initial landings were pretty successful. The Turkish defenders were fairly few and far between. The British got their troops ashore really without too many problems, and they started to bring supplies in. By the following morning, the Navy had successfully landed all the men. But once again, the army commanders failed to press on with the planned attack. They missed what should have been the major objective, which was to go ahead and seize the high ground. When one of Hamilton's staff officers landed on the beach 36 hours later, he expected to find troops advancing inland. What he saw was soldiers bathing in the sea. Um, okay. Once the Turks were on the high ground, they held all the advantages. In a series of increasingly savage battles over the next days and weeks, the British found themselves having possessed a very good landing beach, but pinned into it. In effect, all they had done was to repeat the problems of Helles and Anzac, but on a bigger scale. Why in the world? This seems like a recurring theme to me, um, especially like in the Napoleonic Wars that I've been doing. Um, there, it seems like almost every video there was a marshal or a military commander of some port of some sort that just did not follow orders and did not go through with the attack. And it's not just in the in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. This is in pretty much every war I've studied. It just seems like there's there's always some military commander that just for whatever reason does not go on the offensive like they're supposed to, and they just kind of hang back, which is what this guy did. And I don't know why that is, you know? It seems like if it's a recurring thing that keeps happening in war, that, you know, you could probably, I don't know, fix it? I'm probably being really unfair, though, with these comments, because there could have been extenuating circumstances that I don't know about that uh, caused them to make that decision. But it's just really, really, in it's really interesting to me that this happens all the time in war for some reason. In the first four days of the new offensive, the Allies suffered a further 25,000 casualties across the peninsula. Oh my gosh. And the summer weather at Suvla contributed its own gruesome toll. Yeah, wildfires. Shellfire set dry vegetation alight. Wounded men, trapped by the flames, were burnt alive. Yeah. I've been in wildfires in California. They're not fun. Um, the smoke is awful. Even if you're not in the fire directly, the smoke is bad. And it, you know, wildfires are so dangerous. So I can't even imagine what that was like, too. Well, I can't imagine because I've been through it. But man, just that that compounds everything that on top of everything else going on. Mm. Winston Churchill wrote and varied annals of the British Army contain no more heartbreaking episode 
than that of the Battle of Souvla Bay. The stifling summer heat exacerbated another problem, which had already been acute when the weather was cooler. There was not enough drinking water. The problem here was that when they landed at Gallipoli, there simply weren't enough wells or water supply actually on the peninsula to supply them with the, the needs that they had in terms of the vast number of troops that were soon landed here. So that meant they had to bring water onto the battlefield from outside of the Gallipoli area. Transporting fresh water was difficult and time consuming. So the Allies tried making their own. This is the wreck of a desalination boat which sank in late August 1915. We found the water carrier at uh, Sula. It's around uh, 15, 16 meters. Uh, it's a very shallow depth, uh, but you can still see the huge boilers where uh, they were uh, evaporating the salty water and making fresh water out of this. But many soldiers were not happy drinking water from a sea which they associated with suffering and death. When changing uh, seawater into the uh, fresh water, they've always remembered uh, those soldiers who died in the seas and their blood, you know, was turning the sea into red. And they hardly drank the water, really, at uh, Anzac and at uh, Helles, at Sula. The sea was red uh, with the color yeah. of the dead soldiers. How mm -hmm. could you drink that water? Yeah, I agree with the that. The heat and shortage of clean water inevitably led to health problems disease had begun to wipe out the troops. There were problems with flies, with a large number of dead that was now littering the battlefield, with bodies left out on ground level, on the parapets of trenches, in front of the trenches, hanging on the wire, bodies rotting slowly in the summer sun. Unburied dead, as medical officers had feared, would lead to the spread of disease, and disease was rife here uh, on Gallipoli, particularly diseases like dysentery. Records show that in August, 80% of the troops in the Anzac sector developed dysentery. Every day, hundreds of sick soldiers were being evacuated. By the end of August, it was clear that the Suvla and Anzac offensives had failed. And that brought an end to any credibility that the Gallipoli campaign still had in London. Hamilton was sent home, and his replacement, Sir Charles Munro, came out to the Dardanelles and really took on board what most of the senior officers were saying, which was that it had failed and they should evacuate. Churchill. I mean, yeah, at this point, I mean, there's no point in even staying. You're not advancing, you know, towards the Turks. You're not, you're not accomplishing anything other than just killing a bunch of people. So, yeah, this is uh, very much like our Vietnam over here. I mean, at some point, you just have to kind of make that decision, right? Churchill, who had held on to his place on the government's Dardanelles committee, was outraged by Monroe's decision. He came, he saw, he capitulated. Well, you're not doing anything else, buddy. Churchill resigned. The failures of the military campaign may not have been his fault, but his reputation was sullied. He felt he could no longer continue in politics. I am finished. He joined the army as a battalion commander on the Western Front. Arrangements for the evacuation of Gallipoli began. Allied troops prepared to burn thousands of tons of stores, but they did not want the Turks to realize they were planning to withdraw. All sorts of schemes are developed to convince the Turks that we're actually still here. Indeed, some Australian soldiers set up a cricket match on a piece of open ground there, played cricket, Shells interrupted it, but it gave the Turks the impression that we were still here, that things were normal, but again, in reality, this was deceiving them, and we were slowly withdrawing from the positions here at Gallipoli. Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. The Anzacs are doing their part for playing some cricket. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, I know that the Anzacs did way more than just play cricket, so don't, don't take that. It's just kind of me having some fun here. But that's smart, though, you know? devising schemes to uh, hide your, your withdrawal. It was a massive exercise, and the generals calculated that fighting a rearguard action might cost them 40,000 men. Mm. Ironically enough, the evacuations were really the most successful part of the entire Gallipoli campaign. They were impeccably planned. The staff work was excellent. 
they achieved surprise. And in all three beaches, in, in Suvla, Anzac and Helles, they succeeded in evacuating their troops virtually without losing a man. But many soldiers were deeply ashamed by the retreat. They felt they were letting down their dead comrades. As he passed their graves, one soldier commented, I hope they don't hear us marching back to the beach. The Gallipoli campaign had lasted 259 days. There were a quarter of a million Allied casualties. Many blamed this appalling disaster on Winston Churchill. I mean, An American commentator insane. wrote, It is doubtful if even Great Britain could survive another world war and another Churchill. Twenty-nine <laughs> years later, Churchill was back. Winston Spencer Churchill, the savior of England and thereby the entire free world, takes his place among the immortal names of history. By 1944, Winston Churchill was firmly in place as British Prime Minister. Good old Winnie, they called him then, and forever after. But more than just that, he'd also given himself the title of Minister of Defence. He was very much the directing brain behind Britain's strategic war effort. Now in the Second World War, the man many blamed for the Gallipoli fiasco was in charge of his nation and preparing for another seaborne invasion. There's a quick question there regarding UK politics. Can the prime minister? He he just said that Winston Churchill appointed himself as Minister of Defense. Can you do that? Can you just say, "Hey, I'm going to do this"? That seems like that would be like written down somewhere what the prime minister can and can't do. They can't just like appoint themselves as whatever, or can they? I don't know. I don't know. And I, that's kind of off on a tangent. I don't know. It just caught my ear. Like the Turks three decades earlier, the Germans knew there was likely to be an invasion. So they began to construct formidable defenses. The Atlantic Wall. Field Marshal Rommel, a brilliant strategist, was in charge of the fortifications in France. No beaches had ever been more heavily defended. So how could the Allies avoid disaster this time? The preparations for D-Day were some of the most complicated and comprehensive for any military operation in history. There was a deception plan known as Operation Fortitude, the idea being to persuade the Germans that the major attack would come not in Normandy, but rather in the Pas de Calais. And this seems to have been remarkably successful. Fake <laughs> tanks were placed across the landscape of Southeast England to persuade German spies and aircraft that the attack was going to happen at the closest point to the French coast. I did know about the fake stuff, yeah. Lessons had been learned from Gallipoli, where the forces were given just weeks to prepare for the landings. Some of the troops picked for D-Day practiced for the invasion for more than two years. Oh, wow. But Churchill was still haunted by memories of Gallipoli. He imagined mm. a repetition of the nightmare. Channel tides running red with allied blood beaches choked with the bodies of the flower of American and British manhood. To avoid the infantry bloodbath of World War I, bombers were sent to pulverize the German defenses, and new ways were found of reducing danger on the beaches. For the landings on the British beaches, he relied very heavily on specialized armor, the so-called funnies of 79th Armored Division. The funnies were British inventions. The funnies? The flail was a device to get rid of mines. The okay. petard mortar blew up concrete bunkers. The funnies were all designed to avoid the slaughter of Gallipoli, where soldiers had been mown down while trapped on the shore. Mm. The aim was to clear a path to get men off the beaches as quickly as possible. The Allies chose five beaches on the Normandy coast. The Americans would land on Utah and Omaha, the Canadians at Juneau, and the British at Gold and Sword. But unlike Gallipoli, the D-Day landings didn't begin on the beaches, but a few miles inland. The night before the main attack, airborne troops in gliders were sent to capture important forward targets, like Pegasus Bridge. 
The glider landing here at Pegasus Bridge has been called probably the best feat of flying of the entire war. A handful of men and a handful of gliders are tasked with landing as close as possible to the objective, to the bridge. And through their amazing piloting abilities, the men in the glider pilot regiment are able to land these aircraft only 50 yards from their objective. The men of the Oxenbucks burst out, capture the German defences, and a party under Lieutenant Den Brotheridge cross the bridge. As they reach the other side, Den Brotheridge is caught by a burst of fire, and Lieutenant Brotheridge becomes the first Allied soldier to be killed in enemy action on D-Day. Mm. Pegasus Bridge clearly shows us that planning for D-Day is very different to the planning for Gallipoli in 1915. They're looking beyond the beaches. It's not just about fighting on beaches, it's moving inland. And they're looking at objectives beyond those beaches to move in and build the landing area. Dawn on June the 6th, 1944, the main assault began. Under covering fire from warships, a vast fleet disgorged thousands of men and hundreds of thousands of tons of equipment onto the Normandy coast. It would be a day of mixed fortunes for the soldiers landing on the five separate beaches. The funnies. Desmond Somerville was a veteran of the Gallipoli landings. In 1944, he would wait for news of his 20-year-old son, Nick, who was landing on Gold Beach. I've never seen so many ships in, in an area of water that you can see right round here, right from horizon to horizon, nothing but ships. It was difficult to see, full of smoke and dust, and there were rounds being fired, and you didn't know quite where from, but things were going over your head. And we knew our job was to get off the beach as quickly as possible and get on ahead. Nick Somerville and his men from the South Wales borderers were given bicycles to help them press on quickly inland. Really? <laughs> on the way, there was a, a German 88 millimeter gun. That is like one of the most British things I've seen, I think, in war, is giving your soldiers bicycles. <laughs> I don't think the Americans did that. Uh, I don't know, maybe they did. If I, if they did, I don't know about it. It just seems like a very British thing. I'm not making fun of it. Don't take, don't take me wrong. I'm not making fun of it. It's just an observation. On the way, there was a, a German 88 millimeter gun. And I looked round uh, to a person who was behind me and uh, there was a loud bang and I'm afraid a solid shot blew his head off, and that was rather alarming uh, uh, when one was uh, first rather getting one's alarming. first experience of war. That's what I, I still remember more than the alarming. landing. I saw my first dead bodies. Uh, one saw what war might be like, and I think one had a huge feeling of thankfulness that being, being able to get ashore without too much trouble. Unlike his father, stuck on the beach at Gallipoli, Nick Somerville and his unit quickly covered ground. By the end of D-Day, they were just outside the ancient town of Bayeux. They had advanced further than any other Allied unit that day. We'd come eight miles uh, inland. We'd had to fight one or two small skirmishes and one battle on the way. Our job here was to get this bridge and get dug in for the night and make certain that we were organized to operate in the morning. But one part of the plan hadn't worked out. We were certainly meant to meet up on this bridge with the Americans. That was the idea. But there was no sign of them. And there's, it wasn't the sort of situation where you could go out looking for them very easily. The Americans were still trapped on Omaha Beach. Bloody Omaha, as they later named it. Here, wow, look at that things beach. were going far less smoothly. Very white. Radio man has both legs blown off, and here I'm a sergeant. What do I do? Do I try to save him? I got 12 more men. I got to get up there. I got to get up underneath the buffs as close as I can. The Americans faced crack German troops. The steep bluffs only added to their difficulties. 
one severe handicap for the Americans were the lack of any of the, the funnies, the British specialised armour used for breaking their way through the beach obstacles. Mm. The only funnies the Americans had wanted to use were floating tanks, designed to get ashore from deep water, but few of them ever arrived. My captain told me there would be 50 tanks on the beach. When I landed, there was one tank. Unable to cope with the rough seas, the tanks were quickly swamped. Those oh boys were dropped off too far out, and they had to swim in. A lot of them drowned. They had, look at all the equipment they had. I guess at this point in history, the American military hadn't quite figured stuff out. You know, we, I guess, didn't have enough experience fighting wars at this point, at least outside of our own borders, to, uh, to be as smart as the Brits, you know, and, and developing stuff like, you know, the mine of what they call the funnies, I guess. What are the funnies, too? Because they, they refer to, to these landing craft also as funnies, not just the, the mine sweepers. So is, is the funnies like an all-encompassing term for a certain type of equipment, I guess? I don't know. Uh, it's, just, it's also kind of an odd term to use, but... 2,000 American soldiers died on Omaha Beach that day. More than on all the other four beaches put together. Oh my but we should God, never forget that. that despite everything, the Americans did push off Omaha. Omaha was not a defeat. It was a victory, but it was an excessively bloody one. Six days after D-Day, Winston Churchill made his own triumphant landing on the Normandy coast. It's a nice irony that one person in particular links two of the greatest amphibious operations in history, D-Day and Gallipoli. There were 11 more months of heavy fighting before the war in Europe finally ended. But D-Day was the beginning of the end and its success vindicated Churchill. The victory of D-Day was built on the failure and the sacrifices of Gallipoli, which was summed up by its official historian. The drama of the Dardanelles campaign, by reason of the beauty of its setting, the grandeur of its theme, and the unhappiness of its ending, will always rank among the world's classic tragedies. The story is a record of lost opportunities and eventual failure. Wow, well, I was not expecting to get into World War II stuff. That was an unexpected turn, I guess, in this documentary. But I'm really glad they did because, you know, as we were kind of leaving Gallipoli and they were talking about how they hoped that the dead soldiers didn't see them leaving, that really hit me, you know, because you had 250,000 casualties all for nothing, it seemed like. You know, they, they didn't get anywhere on Gallipoli and it just seemed like all of those deaths would be in vain and that would be really really hard to live with but they made the point here that Gallipoli kind of paved the way for D-Day in World War II. They learned a lot from it. They fixed a lot of the mistakes. So in that sense, the deaths that happened in Gallipoli weren't all in vain. They helped pave the way for the success of the Allies in World War II. So even though at the time it seemed like Gallipoli was a failed campaign, it actually had a positive impact later on. So that's really cool and I'm, I'm glad that they did kind of tie it into World War II like that, which is a completely different aspect of World War II. I had no idea about the Gallipoli campaign and D-Day and Winston Churchill's involvement in both of them and him being concerned that D-Day would go the same way as Gallipoli. I had no idea that a lot of the military commanders who were familiar with Gallipoli were kind of thinking about that during D-Day. So that's really good to have like this historical context now for, you know, some of this stuff in World War II, which I guess is why it's important to study both world wars because I'm sure there were a lot more lessons learned from World War I that they applied during World War II. So I hope you guys enjoyed part two. I did ask for some people who were from Australia and New Zealand to give me some links to videos that dealt more with the Anzacs during all of this. I've gotten a couple of 
of those so we'll be doing those in the future and just kind of more stuff on Australia in the future as well because like I said I think in the previous video that's something that I would like to learn more about. If you can answer any of my questions down in the comments of course I would appreciate it and also just a quick reminder to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and links to all of my social media and my discord are in the description of this video and in my pinned comments if you're interested in any of that. Roger here and I thank you for watching as always and we will see you next time.